There's nothing unusual about the Adventist Church being involved in mission. Mission has always been our focus, but there is something very unusual about a new mission movement taking off in Tokyo. The church in Japan has a burden for the millions of unreached people living in their capital city. They know that without new mission methods, these people will remain unreached. So they invited the General Conference and the Northern Asia Pacific Division to partner with them to create Mission Unusual, a massive church planting and disciple making movement. Key to the development of Mission Unusual are the global mission centers, which focus on creating resources to share the gospel with unreached people groups. Today I'm in Tokyo, one of the world's largest cities. With a population of 40 million, the challenge is great before us. But guess what? Our God is greater. He has given us this mandate in Revelation 14, 6 and other places in Scripture to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So how are we doing? Well, we're not home yet. And that's where we as an Adventist family worldwide can focus on reaching the unreached people groups of the city. There's growing diversity in Japan and the people embrace a variety of lifestyles and subcultures. This includes young people like Sunny Bunny, who use fashion as a form of self-expression. A team of church planting missionaries is already on the ground, learning the language and how best to share Jesus with the Japanese. In time, they'll start new groups of believers who will in turn disciple others. Eventually, they'll be supported by the ministry of global mission pioneers, urban centers of influence, volunteers, and tent makers in a concerted effort to reach the entire city for Jesus. Helping to lead this team is Pastor Nozomu Obara, the president of the East Japan Conference. For years, he's had a passion for church planting, and he and his wife, Sachiko, are actively engaged in a disciple-making ministry for children. Pastor Obara will be transitioning from his position as president to become the associate director for Mission Unusual Tokyo. Greater Tokyo area is a big area with over 40 million people. But in the heart of Tokyo City, there's about 10 million people and only 10 Adventist churches with about 900 worship attendees every week. So one Adventist needs to reach more than 10,000 people. Tokyo is a big challenge. To confront the challenge, Japanese pastors and missionaries will use a holistic approach to mission. Mission Unusual will plant the seeds of mission over the next five years, but the mission won't stop there these efforts will continue to grow and impact people's lives for years to come. Our focus is not just on events and programs. Building relationships and getting involved with people is our focus. Finding out people's needs and meeting people's needs. In other words, implementing Christ's method here in Mission Unusual Tokyo. We'll keep you updated as God leads this movement and uses it for His glory. In the meantime, you too can support Mission Unusual Tokyo. Will you join me in praying for this project as it continues to unfold over the next five years to uplift Jesus in this city? Good morning, everyone. We welcome all our viewers here in Windsor and those outside of Windsor throughout Canada. We welcome our viewers in the United States, in the United Kingdoms, in India, and in Australia, New Zealand. I know there are many who are watching us from these countries. And wherever you are in whichever country on the globe, you're welcome. Thank you for being so faithfully watching and being a part of the YouTube telecast by the Windsor Seventh Adventist Church Sabbath School Department. Thank you via the YouTube. Now this morning we have uh, four
panel members, uh, Gloria Joshua, Randall Scott, Daniel Golowenko, and myself, Charles Shad. And I'll let the members introduce themselves. So Gloria, we'll start with you. With you. you can you introduce yourself to the viewers? I'm Gloria Joshua, and I've, I've been um, an adventurous for many years. I started off in England, went to Newbold College, came to Canada, went to Berman University, went to University in Windsor, and I've been to Kettering Medical Center. I've been a chaplain for 20 years, and now I'm an old lady. But my passion is for health. I said, without our health, we can do nothing. So for the last years, I've been doing the health ministries. Now I've retired from that and doing seniors ministries, retired from that. And I'm still promoting health. So I just want to tell everybody, <laughs> keep yourself healthy, especially during this virus time that we can use our energies to pray and intercede for others. And they, they don't have to be praying for us. We need to be praying for others. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. And we do recognize your uh, leadership as a health leader here at our church in Windsor. Thank you so very much. My name is Daniel Golovenko, and uh, I've enjoyed being with this church community online. It's unfortunate, though, that I will be leaving soon, and I will miss you all. We will miss you, Daniel. Mother, Daniel studies at the Oakwood College in uh, Huntsville, is it? Yep. Yeah. Randall. One, my name is Randall Scott, and I'm very privileged to be a part of this panel discussion. And I thank God for the assurance we have to prayer and that we can also pray for others. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. My name is Charles Shad. I've been here many years now in Windsor. And uh, uh, hopefully, I'll be here for a while. Uh, panel members, uh, you are uh, free to ask any questions, make any comments. And if there is something that you'd like to say, please go ahead and do that. And our opening prayer, Gloria Joshua. Loving God, here we are talking to you again. We call this prayer. But really, we're talking to you to ask you to to listen to us and to guide us through this lesson. It's all about intercession prayer and how to help others, Lord. And therefore we are praying because we need your help. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us through this. And each one of us has a little segment. And as you look down, you say, I wonder what these people are doing. But Lord, we're trying to connect with you and help others to connect with you. And prayer is the way that we do it. Just talking to you. We need to learn to talk to you as we're talking to a friend, open up the connection between us and you, and teaching others, teaching others how to do this, Lord, because without prayer, we are just lost. So we pray that the Holy Spirit, which you sent to us after Jesus left and sent the Holy Spirit to, to give us power and, and guidance and wisdom. And so we ask him for that now, because we ask in that worthy name of Jesus, Amen. 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 Uh, last week we studied seeing people through the eyes of Jesus. Now, it's a very interesting topic because many a time we look at people, but we look at them with our own eyes, not with the eyes of Jesus. Because you remember when, when Jesus first saw Peter? He didn't see him as a rough, loud mouth person, you know, just a fisherman, he saw him as a mighty preacher. And we know that his very first sermon, 3,000 people were baptized. That was Peter. Talk about James and John, the brothers, the sons of thunder. These guys were so quick in their temper, you know, and they were always ready to pick up a fight. Radical fishermen. And yet, Jesus picked them because he could see the enthusiastic proclaimers of grace. When Mary Magdalene or the Samaritan woman or the woman with the issue of blood came to Jesus, he did not ignore them because he saw that these women were longing for love. Love 
was missing in their lives. So my question is, do you see people with Jesus' eyes or do you see them with your own eyes? You remember when Samuel went to anoint David and he saw the first brother and he said, surely he's the one. And God said, no. He saw the second one, more handsome, more appealing. And God said, no. Finally, they came to this David, the rugged, youngest little fellow, rugged, just a keeper of sheep and goat. And when they brought him, Samuel was not impressed, but God said, he's the one anointed. So sometimes we have to look beyond our own eyes and look at what God looks at and what Jesus would look at. Now our lesson, we could go on with this, you know, because it's a very, very interesting topic, but that we don't have time for that today. So our lesson for today and our Bible study for today is prayer power, interceding for others. Our memory text is very interesting, and I love this text. In James chapter 5, verse 16, if you have your Bibles, you can pull it out and look at it. I'm reading from the New King James Version. James 5, verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. There are two phrases that really caught my attention. The first one is, confess your trespasses to one another. The second one is, pray for one another. And then there's a third, third very important one too. It says, prayer of a righteous man avails much. That's a prayer of a righteous man or a woman. It avails much. Now, if you look at these phrases, and I'm going to look at the first one first, it says, confess your trespasses to one another. What does that mean, confess your trespasses to one another? Help me out. What does that mean? Well, um, I would personally say that confess your trespasses one to another means simply to talk it out, to admit when you've made a mistake, admit when uh, there's been a breakdown in a relationship, when things have gone wrong, when you've okay. done wrong, okay. when someone has wronged you. And it is important to talk it out, to actually talking it out to one another is an illustration of the type of prayer we're supposed to have with God. Because we're the sinners, he's the, the forgiver, and we have to talk it out with him. We have to admit that we're wrong. We have to ask for forgiveness. And that's our prayers to him. So how are we supposed to pray to him if we can't even do that to one another? So it is extremely important. Excellent, Daniel. Thank you. Very important to do that. Yes, Gloria. I think I think we have to be authentic. A lot of us don't know what it means to be authentic. You know, we um, put on our Sabbath clothes and we come to church and we look so good and we say such nice prayers and that. But are we really authentic? Mm-hmm. But we have to question ourselves because uh, not how we want other people to see us because God sees us on the inside and knows when we are really genuine and when we are genuinely praying. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe, and I believe that when James was writing this, he was saying, share your concerns with each other. Encourage one another. If somebody is depressed, encourage him. If somebody needs help, help him. And also share your concerns with them and tell them, well, I've gone through this. I can help you. you know? And that's a big thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Gloria, for your input on this. So like I said, the title of our lesson, our study today is Prayer Power, Interceding for Others. Now, it's an interesting word, huh? What does it mean to intercede? What does it mean to intercede? Well, uh, I would say to intercede is simply to take a step into the situation. Uh, 
opposite of that, I would say, is um, indifference. Um, people just stay out of it. They're uninvolved. I don't want to be a part of your life. But to intercede is to actively participate in someone's life, even from a distance. You are praying for them. You are encouraging them through prayer. You are actively being involved in their life through prayer. So to intercede is to remain involved in the community, to remain together. True. You know, uh, of course, we, uh, from a spiritual point of view, yes, we are talking about prayer. But interceding, we can, we can see examples of interceding. You know, when, when a case comes for trial in front of the judge, there is the victim and the, the perpetrator. Now, who represents them? A lawyer who intercedes on their behalf talks to the judge on their behalf and to prove that the victim has been victimized and the person who did the crime needs to be punished. But it is a question of interceding. Here, we are talking about our role as an interceder, intercessor and we are praying to God. Yes, Gloria. I was saying, and the more witnesses they are, the better. Yes. The more people that have seen and, and, and witnessing the better, that's how it is with prayer. The more of us who are witnessing and praying to God together makes a better impact over the devil. <laughs> God well, is just. First. God the is better, just. The better it is, yes. All right. Now, now, now the, the other question that I have is, why should we intercede for one another? Why? Of course, we know we, we should, but why? I didn't hear that. Why should we intercede for others? Why? Uh, because eventually someone else's problem will become my problem. Many people think that if I just ignore the wrongs of others, let them sin, they're not a part of my life, but every wrong that a human being commits will accumulate and affect us all together. Adam and Eve first sin and the entire human population is affected because of their mistake um if only there was someone there to intercede if only adam stopped his wife if only we took action to stop the wrongs before they happen because if we just let it keep going on there'll be a lot of pain have you heard of a, somebody come and say to you i don't know how to pray i had a young man come to me and that was not long ago. And it says, I really don't know how to pray. And so we discussed it, talked about it. And after he left, he realized that a prayer is not something that is formal. It is something that is personal. You talk to God like you talk to a friend. Yeah. And that is prayer. And while you're doing that, you talk to God about someone else who needs help. And you are actually interceding for that person. Yes, Gloria, go ahead. I was going to say that I spoke about this little boy, Riley, that has cancer. Yeah. And he had, he had this chemo and now he's got this fungus. And, and so the grandma Joyce told him that, you know, there's hundreds of people praying for you. This little boy. He just lifted him up because he knew hundreds of people are praying for me. Mm -hmm. It made him feel that, you know, that, that they know God. And he's just a little boy. But he felt that, that, that power of people praying for him. And that's just a little boy. But people who are ill are not able to pray for themselves sometimes. They're so oh, ill. But when they feel the power of others praying for them, it lifts them up spiritually, lifts them up to God, and opens the way for God yeah. to answer the prayer. You know, the reality is that when we pray, we pray for our spouses, we pray for our children, our parents, we pray for our family, our extended family, our close friends. And that's about where we come and say, Amen. We do not pray for others 
until there is a problem, someone is seriously ill, or someone is on deathbed, or someone has financial problems, or someone has something else which is very serious, and somebody makes an appeal, the pastor makes an appeal, or the elder makes an appeal, that we need to pray for so and so. We do pray for that person. But normally we don't. Well, why do we always have to pray and ask God for something? Repeat that question again. That is a very powerful question. Yeah, why do we just have to pray when we want to ask God for something, like make an appeal all the time? Why can we not just pray? You know, I, I, I've learned this lately. You know, I go down to the waterfront in the morning and I do my stretching exercises and I lift my hands up and I see the blue sky and I say, oh God, you up there in the heavens and you're looking down at us. Thank you that you created all this stuff around us for us to enjoy. Thank you for being God. Just thank you for being there for me. I've learned just to praise, thank you. When I look up into the heavens, I don't know where God is, but God is up there. He created this universe and I don't understand it, but I know that he's watching over me and he's caring and loving me. Amen. amen. We say amen to that, of course. Gloria. Yeah. You know, the early Christians, they felt the need for prayer. And I love this verse in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. I'm reading it from the New King James Version. And this is what happened. When they had prayer, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. You know, their prayers were earnest. They were so sincere in their prayers that they developed a direct relationship with God the Father, the Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. No wonder they were filled with the Holy Spirit. No wonder the result was that when they spoke the word of God, they spoke with boldness and with conviction. And we know that after the Holy Spirit descended on the 120 that were gathered together, that they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we know what, when Peter spoke, 3,000 people were baptized, repented. Many others were repented. And not only that, they carried the message with them wherever they went. And people accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior and the church grew. Now, these early Christians, they also realized that the gospel had to preach to the world in order to save souls for Christ. They also prayed for one another. You know, when we submit ourselves to God and seek him, we will also intercede for others. God works in our hearts. He draws us closer to him. And he gives us divine wisdom to reach others. When we talk about a cosmic struggle, there are three important verses or texts found in the Bible which help us to understand the importance of intercessory prayer. And uh, I know Gloria is going to talk about that one uh, text which is found in Revelation 12. And so I'll let her do, do that. Now, if you read Ephesians 6 verse 12 and 2 Corinthians verse 10, please make a note of that, you can read it. Um, Ephesians 6 verse 12, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. Here the Bible lifts the veil between the unseen and the unseen world. There's a struggle between good and evil, between the forces of righteousness and the forces of evil, darkness. Between Christ and Satan, there's a struggle. But the beauty is that God is not silent. He is aware of what's going on 
he's in control and therefore he does that which we do not expect. John 16 verse 7 and 8 makes it very clear that he will send the Holy Spirit to convict men and women of divine truth which you and I cannot do. We can give them the message but we cannot convince them. It's the Holy Spirit that convinces them and convicts them. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 1 verse 14 says that the heavenly angels will enter the battle to influence people for eternity. Now that's something I had never, never known that even the holy angels will come. We give the message, we pass it on, but the holy angels will come and help the people to become changed in order to become precious souls for the kingdom of God. And then God also arranges providential events in people's life which lead them to him. Um, There's a question. Is there something that God will not do? Or is there anything that God will not do? Something? Okay. Yes, there is one thing God will not do. He will not force anyone to accept the kingdom of God against his or her will. He has given us a choice. And we have the right to choose between right and wrong. Adam and Eve had that choice. And they chose to disobey rather than to obey. You know, because the principle of forcing people is contrary to the principle of love. God does not do that. We know that love is the foundation of God's government. This is where intercessory prayer comes in. Although God is doing everything to reach people before we pray for them, our prayer unleashes the mighty powers of God for those people. God respects our freedom of choice in praying for those we choose to pray for. God respects that. But he will do more for others when we pray for them. Therefore, we need to intercede for others. Let me read a statement from one of my favorite authors. And it's taken from one of our books, The Great Controversy, page 525. And I'm quoting Ellen White as the author. And this is what she writes. It is a part of God's plan to grant us in answer to the prayer of faith, that which he would not bestow, did we not ask. So my friends, ask, and it shall be given to you. Even Jesus said that, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. Pray for each other, so that the power of the Holy Spirit will work in full measure, on the souls that are still groping in darkness. Our three other panel members, uh, Randall will talk about Jesus, the mighty intercessor. Daniel Galowenko will talk about Paul's intercessor prayers, unseen power at work, and Gloria Joshua will talk about prayer focus. So Randall. It is very interesting to note that, uh, you know, God, who is sinless, he was so much um, concerned with his fellow human being in terms that he's always seeking our good. And one of the ways through which he, he did it was to keep a close communion with his father. And sometimes I wonder within myself as sinful human beings, we find it so challenging to talk to God. And if Jesus himself, who was sinless, found it a necessity 
I believe the prayer life of a Christian should be one of necessity and not of only when there's something, you know, bad is happening, then we seek it. We see Jesus here. He prayed at every um, interval in every section of his life throughout this um, Monday section. At his baptism, he prayed. And we see where the, 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 um, his father accepted him. You know, the Holy Spirit came upon him as a dove, sanctioned his baptism. And he prayed there. He also prayed for his disciples that they fail not. And just as he had prayed for his disciples, he's also praying for us today. Um, in the first paragraph of, of, of Monday, it said, Jesus' life was one of constant divine communion with his Father. At the time of his baptism, when he launched his messianic ministry, Jesus prayed for divine power to accomplish heaven's purpose. The Holy Spirit empowered him to do the Father's will and accomplish the task before him. Whether it was at the feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the leper, or the deliverance of the demonic, Jesus recognized that in the battle between good and evil, prayer is a mighty weapon to beat back the forces of hell. Prayer is heaven's ordained way of combining our helplessness and our weaknesses with God's omnipotent power. It is means of having ourselves lifted up towards God, who alone can touch the heart of those for whom we pray. So Jesus set the example for us, um, praying, and likewise as believers, we too should be ever busy in prayer. First Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, 17 says we should pray without ceasing. So the life of the Christian should be one of prayer and supplication. And it is also uh, noteworthy to know that when we pray for each other, it we strengthen our own faith and it does something. It's a ministry to which we elevate each other and compass the, the, the throne of grace where we can find help in time of need. It's an effectual soul winning our men and women of prayer. So if we want to have successful evangelism in our church, prayer should be the focal point. Jesus prayed for Peter by name. He reassured Peter that at the time of his greatest temptation, he would be praying for him. Satan understood quite well Peter's potential for the advancement of the kingdom of God. He planned to do everything possible to destroy Peter's positive influence in the Christian church. But through all of these temptations, Jesus was praying for Peter. And the master's prayer were answered. What a thrilling reality to recognize that the Savior is praying for us too. He invited us to join him in this work of missionary, intercessionary prayer and lift up others by name before the throne. Our persistence in prayer acknowledges that we recognize our total, absolute dependence on God to reach the individual for whom we are praying. So we can't live without prayer. This is one of the ways that we communicate with heaven. And I'm very happy to know that when I pray, I have the confidence according to God's will that my prayer is answered. So Jesus set the example for us. And I want to encourage us that we too should follow this example as we seek to pray for our brothers and sisters. All right. That is a powerful message. That is important that we are reminded that Christ prayed and it is also essential for us to pray. If God himself on earth had to pray to be empowered, to witness, to minister to the needs of the community, then how much more so it is important for us to pray as Christians. Yes. Um, that is what the Monday lesson is covering. That is what you, Brother Scott, were presenting to us, that importance of always being in prayer. 
Um, I would just like to ask before we move on to Tuesday of how do you think an individual can always be praying? Uh, what does that mean to your own life to always be in prayer? Uh, it is just simply saying that we must always have our antenna, so to speak, up. In other words, we should have a daily communion with God. It's not that we're going to kneel every time or prostrate, but our, our, our mind will be centered on Jesus Christ, you know, and having that one-to-one -one relationship. We, we, we understand the, 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 the scenario with um, Enoch. He was translated, right? Uh, his relationship was so knitted with Jesus Christ. And that's the kind of relationship God wants us to have, this constant communion, thinking about him. And you know, when you're in love with somebody, your, your, your thought is always there, centered there upon that individual. You, you, you can't live without the person or live outside of the ambit of the person. And that is what God is seeking of us. Amen. Amen. Um, as we have just heard how Christ prayed, how he was mighty in interceding for us, um, we move on to Tuesday where we see how one of his disciples, one of his apostles, Paul, was also very much interceding in prayer for the early Christian church. Um, we're given two examples of prayers that Paul wrote down in his letters where he prayed for the church, for them to witness to the communities around them. Um, almost all of Paul's letters actually begin with a prayer for the community. If they don't begin with a prayer, they very certainly end with a prayer for the community. Because the early apostles recognized how important it is to pray. Because if you do not pray, you do not have that power, that motivation, that inspiration to actually do the work. And it's interesting what Paul prayed for. Um, Paul in Ephesians, he well, will turn to there and I'll actually read it. It's Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and I'll begin around verse 17 and I'll read a little bit onward. It says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of him. Mm -hmm the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Paul yeah. is praying for the early church to understand the power of God, to understand just how capable God is of helping them in their ministries. He says, I hope that you understand that God, who was so powerful to resurrect Christ, is yeah. able to work through you to minister to unbelievers and resurrect faith in them. Because every human being is a child of God, and those who do not believe simply have not yet met him their new life has not begun. They have not been reborn. And if God is powerful enough to resurrect Christ, then he is certainly powerful enough to work through Christians to resurrect the community around them. Paul is praying that they would have understanding of who God is, that they have understanding of the power that he has promised to give them. Now, that's extremely important. Because many people feel like they do not have to be reminded of the obvious. Every Christian certainly believes that God is powerful. Every Christian certainly acknowledges that God is powerful. And so many of us sometimes neglect to be reminded of his power in our lives. Some of us are not paying attention to how he's working in our lives. Um, and some of us are not listening to how he's working in our lives. And that is why Paul was praying for other Christians. It's interesting that Paul is not only praying for unbelievers in his ministry, he's also praying for Christians that they'd be stronger in their faith, in their beliefs, because while well, it is well known that sometimes Christians have struggles, sometimes Christians have doubts, but when we pray for one another, when we encourage one another in Christ, 
then God will certainly affirm us with his power in ministry. Uh, there's a second example given in Philippians, and I won't continue to read exactly what is written there. But he, you know what, actually, I will, I will. Let's turn to Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, because it's always important to read from the word of God. It's always important to see what he is saying to us. Uh, so Philippians chapter 1, and I'll begin in verse 3, just a few verses I'll read selectively. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day, even until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now Amen. that is a very powerful verse that is some powerful that is a powerful prayer paul is always praying for the philippian church in every prayer and he is praying with joy he's praying with joy because sometimes as christians when we evangelize when we minister uh we we feel disappointed because we may throw an evangelistic campaign and maybe only three people visit and uh, sometimes we can be disappointed because our efforts aren't producing what we expected. But it is important to recognize that it's not us who's supposed to be working in witnessing. It is Christ in us who is working. And Paul is praying with joy because he knows he who began a work in us is faithful to complete that work in us. So oh, Christ is truly always at work in us to witness. And prayer is that connection, that reminder that he is always working in us. And so I want to ask uh, the discussion group, and I'm glad to see Elder Charles has been able to join and connect with us. Um, how do you feel God is working in your life, inspiring you, affirming you that he is still working in your ministry? That's a good question, Danny. Well, I can, I can affirm that he's working within me. Um, a few months ago, since we have started um, our prayer ministry concerning in our family life, every Wednesday we have been having um, prayer and fasting. And we have been praying and we have seen success um, as we pray. So I have the assurance that indeed as we pray, God is working through us and the community at large. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good comment. Yes, Gloria. I want. I want to just say I'm taking this part of my lesson already. I'm making making my example, but you know I I've been praying to God for years and years. I'm I'm an old lady now. I'm in my eighties, and He's taken me every step of the way through my difficulties, through all these raising my children. And here we come to COVID-19. So in the beginning of it, you know, I felt so frustrated. I just thought, I can't live like this. I don't want to live like this. I'd rather die than having to live like this. And so I had to talk to God about it and said, God, I just don't understand this. This is not the way of life that I can stand. My family's not here. I'm alone. I'm isolated. I don't feel the love of anyone because I'm just alone here. And so I prayed, Lord, I, I know that you love me. I know that my children love me. I know that my friends care about me. I just don't feel it inside of me. I need to know and feel it from the depth of me. And, you know, somehow other this feeling of God's love came right over me. And I felt that, you know, I just relaxed and said, this is wonderful. I know that God is right here with me. I feel it and I know it. I knew it in my head, but now I feel it in my heart, in my body. And it's changed me. And even though things are going on, I know that I look forward to things are going to get worse before Jesus comes, but he's going to see me through. He's answered my prayer and I feel him in the depth of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great testimony. Thank you. Amen. 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 Um, we were just talking about in the Tuesday 
section of the lesson about how Paul was praying for the early church. And now let's turn to Wednesday and compare these two, how a, in the New Testament, Paul is seen praying for the church and how we have another example in the Old Testament of praying for the community, praying for witnessing. And this is unseen powers at work. This is referencing the story of Daniel chapter 10. Um, Daniel is a very complex portion of the Bible with prophecies and stories and a lot of depth to the scriptures there. But what is important in this section of Daniel is what is going on here. Daniel has been receiving visions from the Lord. He has been receiving prophecies. He's been writing them down. And at this point, Daniel has had a very long, a very extensive life. And he is not yet seeing the fulfillment of that promise that the Jews would return to their homeland. He knows that Jeremiah made that promise, that prophecy, that one day they would get to return. But Daniel's not seeing it happening. And so he is concerned. And so he turns to prayer and he is praying that God would work once again for his community, that he would intercede on behalf of his community and fulfill, keep that promise that he made to them, that he would return them to their homeland. And so he's praying for three, three weeks and nothing's happening. And right there is a very important lesson to be learned. He's praying for three weeks, even though nothing's happening. He's still fasting and praying. Um, there's this statement you have to push. You have to pray until something happens. And that is extremely important. We always have to remember, we have to continue to pray until something happens, until God gives us an affirmation, a sign, clarity as to what's going to happen next. And so Daniel's praying. And then suddenly an angel appears to him and the angel gives him a prophecy but what's interesting is what the angel says to Daniel as to why he has not been able to come sooner. And let's actually turn there to Daniel chapter 10. Uh, give me one second to find it in my Bible. The Daniel, what you said was absolutely correct. We give up very easily when God doesn't answer our prayers or we think he's not answering our prayers and we give, it, give up very easily. But here is an example. And we can find many examples in the Bible which tell us that they continued to pray and finally they got the answer. Yes, go ahead with your text. Um, give me one second to find it. Uh, all right. Uh, Daniel chapter 10, starting at verse 12, and I'll read verse 12 and 13. Uh, then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand, and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Now, that is extremely interesting, what is being said in this passage. First off, the angel is affirming that since the very first day you set your heart to prayer, you were heard. Yes. Even though nothing was happening, you were still heard. From that very moment you started to pray, you set your heart humbly before God to understand God was willing to answer. God heard you and immediately sent an angel to come and give you an answer. But unseen forces were at work here. It says that the prince of Persia withstood him. Um, now there's many interpretations to what exactly that means. Different Christian denominations have different ideas. But I believe it's rather clear that the prince of Persia is representative of Satan, of yes, evil right. withstanding the will of God in this world. So what's interesting here is that Daniel is praying for God to do something, and God is doing something, yet the forces of evil are actively trying to withstand what God is trying to do. And so sometimes when we're praying for our ministry, for our witnessing, for our church community, and nothing seems to happen, 
It's not because God is unresponsive. It's because the devil is actively trying to thwart, trying to stop, trying to prevent God from being active in this world. And that is why it's important that Christ said in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because that is the ideal. God wants his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. But unfortunately, sin has created a barrier, has created a distraction, has limited how much God is able to pour himself out because humanity is sinful and the devil is actively working sometimes through us to prevent God from working in us. And it is, it is troubling, but it's important to see that still we should pray even if we're not seeing results immediately. Even Absolutely. if things seem to be stalled, God is still listening to our prayers. And so intercessory prayer, may, we may be disappointed because we've been praying for a year now. We've been praying for three years. We've been praying for a decade for a certain individual to respond to the love of Christ. We've been praying for nearly our entire lifetimes for a certain individual, a certain family member, a certain community member, a friend, the church at large, for something to happen, and it still hasn't happened yet. But that doesn't mean we should be discouraged and give up praying, because prayer is still powerful, and God still hears it even if the devil is actively trying to prevent him from working in that person's life. And so we should take hope that God still hears whenever we pray, no matter what is happening, no matter how disappointing it may be sometimes. Prayer is ministry in itself. Prayer is a witness. Um, I've gone door to door before. I've done some active ministry work in the communities in which I've lived. And some people feel that that is true witnessing. When you go out there, when you're active, when you do something, and then at a certain age, when you're no longer able to do that, people are like, well, they're not actually witnessing anymore because they can't go door to door. They can't do that. But that's not true. A prayer warrior is as necessary as someone going door to door, as someone going out there in the field to serve. Because prayer is ministry. Prayer is a witness. Paul prayed for his churches, even though he was not with them to work in their communities. He was praying for them to do the work. And God was listening to his prayer. Daniel was nowhere near Jerusalem, but he was praying for his people. And God still heard his prayer. And so let us remember that prayer is not something to be neglected. It's something to be remembered, to be encouraged, and to actively continue doing because prayer is a necessity. And so now we're turning to Thursday, I believe, and how to be focused in prayer. Gloria, go ahead. I want to ask you the question, does prayer work? We're talking about does prayer work? You know, if I lose my keys or I put it someplace I don't know where I find, I say, oh, Lord, help me to find my keys. Oh, I found it. Okay, God, I found my keys. Thank you. <laughs> well, what about if we're praying for someone that is um, mentally ill and we're asking God to help them through this and we, we pray and we pray and nothing happens. We think nothing is happens because we don't see the big picture. And I was listening to an example on, I was going to give my own example, but I thought this was very powerful. This lady was saying that she had a son Mm -hmm. who was really, really depressed. Nothing seemed to help him. And so he just gave up. And uh, one night the phone rang and she just heard some mumbling and she said she couldn't tell what it was, but she was, she knew in her heart that it was a son. So immediately they went to the son, and there he was trying to commit suicide. He had failed in the process. He had written the letter and whatever told the saying. And she said, but when they got that time with him, he could explain how he felt, what was going on, and that he really loved God, and God really loved him. But something was chemically wrong with him, which they couldn't make right. And he says, I just can't live like this. So they spent a lot of time with him, day after day, day after day. And they finally understood 
but he he really wasn't wanting to live anymore and he did commit suicide and he did die but he said you know we were at peace with this we prayed and we asked god to help him and some or other the only peace he could get was to feel that if he died he would have peace and he would see god face to face one day he believed that Parents accepted that and said, you know, we had that time. We kept on praying and we felt that that was the way that God accepted that prayer and answered that prayer that way. And I thought that was really strange because I never thought about it like that. If a person commits suicide and they made their peace with God and they couldn't continue living, would God accept them? That's quite a question, but I could see that. I could see how much he loved God and God loved him. And that opened up a whole new thought in my mind. And then I thought about a very simple illustration. We had a lady in our church whose name was Isabel Maguire. Mm -hmm. She lived for a long time and she finally had to go to a nursing home. And she was far away from here. I can't remember where the nursing home is. Do you remember where our nursing home is in? not St. Catherine's, somewhere up there, anyway. And uh, I visit her one day and she says to me, I don't know who you are. I don't remember anything. But I remember that God loves me and I love God. That's mm -hmm. all she remembered. And so a woman that lived her life in prayer ended up not knowing anything, but she remembered the most important thing that God loved her and she loved God. So with all the things we discussed like that, if we end up where we don't remember anything, that's the important thing to remember. And uh, in our, in our um, lesson this week, we're talking about why intercessory prayer, praying for others. And it all goes back to the cosmic conflict. And I want just to look at Revelation chapter 12, 7 to 10. Revelation chapter 12. You can turn in your Bibles to it. Revelation chapter 12. Seven to twelve. Yeah, seven to twelve. And this 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 is the big tell us about this cosmic conflict. It says here, yeah, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. That great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of, the, of his Christ. Mm. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as they shrunk from death. Therefore rejoice in heaven, you and you who dwell with them. I'm going to stop there. We have to think about this cosmic conflict going on all the time. So we are praying and the devil doesn't like it when we pray because we are in communion with God. And Satan accused God of being unjust and a bully. That's the big thing unjust and a bully that's his accusation mm -hmm. god is unjust and intercessory prayer intercess, intercessory prayer when there's more than one of us one or two or a group when we're praying it shows the devil that it's not just god it's these people that's joining with god in prayer asking god god is not a bully god is listening and he's going to answer the prayer as he sees the best way. Now, sometimes um, we pray 
a lot of times, and God doesn't answer the prayer as we would like him to answer. And I'm going to look at, um, I'm, I'm jumping around you to Hezekiah, the example of Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20. He was Hezekiah. So he, he got this message that he got to put his house in order because he's going to die. And he will not survive. He did not want to die. And so he prayed, Lord, please help me. I'll f forgive me. He pleaded. So and God said, oh, I'll give you 15 more years to live. He got 15 more years to live. Now, is that an answer to prayer? Yeah, it's an answer to prayer. But what did he do with those 15 years? It ended up that, you know, he got so proud that people came to visit him and uh, God had answered his prayer. He shows them all the treasures that he has. He's so proud of everything. And finally, you know, when he dies and his son takes over, they know where to come and plunder. And they lost, they lost everything. They were taken captives to Babylon. So it shows us sometimes we want God to answer our prayer, but it's not the best. And... Um, uh, right now, we're praying for a lot of people. We're praying for uh, Riley, this little boy that's, that's got cancer and uh, had this chemotherapy, and now he's got a fungus in his leg. And we keep on praying. We don't know where this will go, but we know God is listening, and God is understanding what's going on, and he's got a grandma that's going to have surgery with tomorrow. She's got cancer. How much can a, a family take? If they did not know that they've got all these people asking God, praying to him, opening up them the way so God can hear and, and, and comfort them. And sometimes, you know, sometimes death happens. We're not praying. We, we don't like death to happen. But there's a first and there's a second death. The first death is asleep. If we are spiritually in harmony with God and we fall asleep, there's a resurrection morning. Yes. But if we are not in harmony with God and we die, there's a second death where there's no, there's eternal death. So when God answers the prayer and someone dies, we don't know why the person dies like that, but we know that God will resurrect them mm -hmm. when Jesus comes. And that, that is the blessed hope. And in my life, many things have gone wrong. I can't understand why my marriage failed. I prayed about it. I prayed that Lord give me the right person to marry. Married and had children. My, 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 after, tw after 20 years of marriage, my husband disappeared and left me with the children. How was I going to live? But God answered the prayer and took, me, took us day by day and provided for us. Took me to school. I was going through a divorce while... I was studying theology, studying Greek. How do you study Greek when someone's divorcing you? I asked God to help me to concentrate five minutes at a time so I could remember some of these things that I learned. I said, you know, I passed with honors, Amen. going through the divorce and, and raising my children. Amen. I don't know how I did it. I never did it. But God did it for me. So I know God answers prayer. I didn't want to be divorced. That was not what, what I wanted to do. But God answers prayer. And he, he gave me another path and, and, and embraced me. And uh, here I am, an old lady. My children are now grown up. But when I look back through all the trials that I went through, God didn't answer the prayers that I asked. But he answered the bigger picture. And I may never know the answers to some of these things, but when I get to heaven, I will know. Amen. But it's my job to stay spiritually linked with God. Yes. I, I have to give you another, uh, I, I think I gave you an example, enough example already, but we have to look at some of these other characters. How about um, Job? Let's think about Job. In Job 16, he had all these miserable comforters. You know, you know if, you have, if you are sick and lost everything, can you, I, I, I don't know how, we, how you would think about it. He lost everything. He lost his children. He lost all his wealth. He, lost, he, he just had nothing. And he covered in sores and he's miserable. And here comes people to comfort him. And they say to him, Job, you must have done something wrong. God is not answering your prayers. 
we'll pray for you. You know, they had these long, flowery prayers. Like some people pray sometimes, long and flowery. But the prayer was not the genuine prayer from the heart. Mm -hmm. The genuine prayer from the heart is the heart, Lord, please help us, Job. Please bless him. Help us. What can we do to help him? You know, most people say, I'll pray for you, but they do nothing about it. I'll pray for you. Where's your faith? That doesn't help us. If you say to somebody when they are sick and say, I'll pray for you, or where's your faith? We need to do something more than that sometimes and just, just pray and, and say, I'll pray for you. Um, and so, what did Job say? Job listened to them and he says, Job prays, even now, this is Job from verse 19, even now my witness is in heaven, my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high, my intercessor is my friend, as my eyes pour out my tears to you, O God. He's pouring out his tears, he's genuine, He's suffering, but he has that witness in heaven. He believes in God. Oh, on behalf of, on behalf of all these people, Lord, I'm praying. On behalf of, I'm praying for them. They, they're supposed to be praying. For, I'm praying for them, Lord. I'm pleading for them. And as he pleads and intercesses for his friends who do not know how to pray, God answers his prayer. God blesses him abundantly. But it was not because um, of the friends. It was because of his connection with God. No matter what happened, he lost everything. But he held on and he believed in God. There's more examples in, in our lesson. An example of Samuel pleading for his people. Samuel pleading for his people. They asked for a king. When they had king, when they had God as their king, they wanted another king. And God gave them a king. But really, they did not need a king. They needed to be connected to God, their king. Mm -hmm. be, it says there, be sure to fear the Lord and to serve him faithfully. You don't need any human kings. Serve him faithfully with your heart. Consider the great things he has done for you. Yet, if you persist in doing evil, both you and the king will be swept away. Yeah. You and the king will... So, sometimes they pray and God answers their prayer in a different way and they don't see it. But I'm just thinking the big picture in the cosmic conflict, the big picture in the cosmic conflict, the battle will be over and God will have answered all our prayers. We're praying now for different things, but when the battle is over and Jesus comes, and we go to heaven, we'll see the answer to all our prayers. So we just have to keep on praying and praying and sometimes it's not what we want, but in the end we'll see that God has answered the prayers in the right way. Thank you, God, for that hope, that blessed hope. Amen. Amen. In closing, let me say this. When we pray for others, God honors our commitment to Him and our dependence upon Him. As our prayers ascend to the throne, the angels spring into action at his command. Thank you, panel members, and thank you for this study. Let's close with a prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the privilege that thou hast given us, that we were able to study thy word. We pray for all those who are viewing today's YouTube and I pray that, that their hearts would be touched and that each one would spend more time in prayer, not only for themselves, but for one another and for those who need prayer. So thank you 
Thank you, Father God. When Jesus comes, may we all have a place in those eternal homes. It is our prayer in thy holy and worthy name. Amen. 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 Amen.